What better way to start off the new year than by covering a game I had meant to cover near the end of last year? Today we're going to be talking about an indie game that kind of went under the radar by the name of Drake Hollow. Drake Hollow, as you can see for yourself with the footage here, is a third-person sandbox structured game with certain third-person shooter and RPG mechanics infused. One of the first things you'll notice is that it does have quite a lovely cartoonish art style. I'm a big fan of games that can pull off the cartoony aesthetic well, and in general I think it helps the game hold up in years to come, compared to more realistic visuals. And to a secondary degree, I think it gives the art team more creative liberty to make the game stand apart visually from other similar games. Drake Hollow's art style comes across somewhat to me as something of a cross between those of Fortnite and Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. But even then, it's not a clear-cut comparison, which is a good thing, as ever. When the player first starts a game, you get to create your own character. The character creator is quite simplistic, with very few customizable options. So I quickly gave up trying to make the character look even remotely like me, and ended up just tweaking a few things and making my character look more like Luna Lovegood from the Harry Potter films instead. After that, my Ivana Lynch lookalike got hurled into the introductory cutscenes and mandatory tutorial. And yes, I'm being a little critical in that last bit, because while I do like my games offering me the opportunity to pursue a lengthy tutorial if I want to, I don't enjoy the prospect of unnecessarily and unwanted handholding. I have the mentality of a cat in this regard. I want to be presented with options, and of my own volition decide what to do with that information. I'm not going to really get into the story if for no other reason than the game itself doesn't really bother to do so itself. It's basically your Chronicles of Narnia setup. You have that lonely kid who accidentally stumbles across a portal to another world, and then finds themselves stuck in that world, filled with magical creatures both friendly and hostile. And you're stuck there until you restore peace in order to a world filled with chaos and strife. I don't mind that it is a totally generic cookie cutter bog standard plot, but there's no denying it still is all those things easily. You're aided by this mystical crow who thinks he's being snarky and cool, but ends up sounding like he's being written by a middle schooler who thinks he's being snarky and cool. With the crow's help, and honestly, the crow's not all that helpful, you start to build your base. Yes, this is a tower defense type game, at least kind of, but we'll come back to that later. After building the bare essentials, you'll need to recruit these what I think are supposed to be cute onion people. I didn't really find them so, but likewise, I didn't consider those little knockoff penguins from Star Wars Episode Eight to be that cute either. So maybe I'm not the best judge of cuteness, since a chunk of the internet seems to disagree on me on that one. Actually, in hindsight, I think they might be radishes, but... I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. The purpose of these little vegetable people, aside from looking potentially cute, is basically for them to be your indentured servants. They build your base for you once you place a schematic step by step. The base building process is very odd from both a visual and gameplay perspective. I'm not sure why, but the developer has implemented base building in a way that very much resembles a mobile game you'd play on your smartphone or tablet. I'm not kidding here. This big circular indicator pops up over where the building is supposed to be constructed, it'll start off at a insanely slow build speed, which your little vegetable people can help speed up by assisting in the construction process. You don't even fully see unique animations for the buildings being constructed, they just rise out of the ground slowly, fully formed. I feel like the only thing missing here is a big pop-up above it with the label, spend 5 gold to build instantly. It would have been more interesting if the speed of the building construction increased or decreased, depending on how many of your NPCs were assigned to build it. But that's not the case, you can't even pick which NPC you want assigned to work on said building. Not that's really a huge problem, because 90% of the time your NPCs are not doing a single bloody thing. Instead, they just waddle around your house playing, eating, or sleeping. Basically like most of us in this lockdown. They're frankly useless for the most part, and they are basically the only somewhat interesting and unique gameplay mechanic in this game, and that's especially disappointing. You could have done so much with this. You could have them in charge of creating and sustaining gardens in order to supply food for the base, or irrigate the land in order to better fertilize the land, and in doing so, regrow trees and other plants that were cut down by the player. The list goes on. You could even have these NPCs have unique passive traits that make them better suited to one type of task over the others enabling the player to be more selective over who is assigned to what task in order to maximize effectiveness. If you're going to have a game revolve around survival and crafting, don't half-ass it and give us only the basics. That said, they do have a few decent uses that will prove helpful to the player at times. They can heal you if you become injured, and they provide you with upgrade points allowing you to more rapidly upgrade your base, and they even give you certain passive perks that can aid you while exploring the more hostile lands beyond your starting island. Sounds pretty great, right? In principle, yes. 
However, in practice, there are a few trade-offs. Naturally, you'd want to have some kind of trade-offs to offset the potential for unlimited building. However, the goal is usually to have said trade-off be equal to or slightly lesser than the advantages being given. This is not necessarily true the farther you progress into the game. The more onion people you have doing work for you, the more resources they consume. They need food and water, they need entertainment, they need places to sleep. By the time you've found even half of the total NPCs and added them to the camp, you're spending almost all your free time either in your base building or repairing uh, their necessities, or collecting resources from them, or alternatively, scouting around the entire bloody map trying desperately to find more and more and more resources to sustain their growing needs. It gets to the point that it becomes almost impractical to play the game as a solo experience on its normal difficulty setting due to the resource management component alone. If you intend to play this game at all, I highly recommend either playing with at least one other friend or not playing this game at all. I should note, technically there is one component that does somewhat help with the whole resource collection aspect. There is an in-game trading store where you can sell various semi or entirely useless items to an NPC in return for more useful stuff like food supplies or ammo for your weapons. However, this is a very costly endeavor and not meant to be relied upon to any great extent. It's a nice add-on, but it doesn't really change my opinion on the overall resource system, since it's not really intended as a substitute, but rather an additive. To the developer's credit, in December of last year, they did come out with a post-launch update that added a ton of gameplay modifiers that allows the user to customize their gameplay experience. These include weapon and ammo scarcity, enemy difficulty, etc. And to some degree, this does somewhat alleviate some of the game's grind problems, especially if you plan on playing solo, but only somewhat. Not unlike taking an Advil pill after having just broken your finger. Exploring around the map is pretty cool, or at least it is during some of the earlier segments, when you actually have a slower pace and thus have the time to appreciate your surroundings, as opposed to the more endgame type of content, where you're so focused on running all the way across the map within a handful of minutes in order to find more and more resources before the next enemy wave attacks your base. The map does not procedurally generate supplies nor allow supplies to be recurring in nature. Once an area has been looted, you cannot come back days or weeks later to loot it again. Effectively, this means you are prevented from replaying the game extensively past a certain point, because all your villagers are going to inevitably die of starvation no matter what you do. So you might as well let them die quickly rather than prolong their agony. Because in a game all about crafting and survival, a premeditated and arbitrary limit to how long the game will let you survive definitely fits right in, right? The combat in this game is okay. On one hand, the weapons are fairly creative and fun to use, but, but they nearly all involve just spamming left click while flanking around enemies to avoid getting hit. It's pretty straightforward. Nearly all the enemies are exclusively melee oriented in nature, although there are a handful that deal projectile type damage. And even one hostile enemy that I've seen that acts as a summoner, calling forth minions to assist him while trying at all times to run away like a little bitch and stay out of range of my attacks. There are the foundations for good combat here, but the limited amount of enemy variety makes many encounters feel excessively repetitive, especially the longer you play. The endgame content, if it really can be called that, mainly revolves around eliminating groups of enemies then destroying these weird intertwined plant vines that cause enemies to spawn. These things look like something Poison Ivy from the Arkham Asylum games would create. They're pretty easy to spot and pretty easy to destroy. Sometimes while destroying them, you see this little on-screen time countdown, telling you you only have a certain number of seconds to destroy it before you're consumed by whatever void energy that plant is giving off. But in almost every single instance, you'll have more than enough time to do what you need to do. This also happens whenever you get too close to any body of water in the game. But the... <laughs> There, there is a kind of hilarious exploit here. At one point early in the game, I couldn't figure out how to safely get across the water in order to explore other islands and get myself some camp resources. It actually turned out to be a pretty easy process, involving me crafting a specific potion that grants temporary immunity to the aforementioned dark energy. But me being me, I instead decided that no matter what it took, no matter the sacrifice, no matter how many times I would die, be born again and die again, I would cross that water and make it to the other side. Death would not be the end. No, it would only be the beginning. People think in terms of good and evil, but really, time is the enemy of us all. Joking aside, yes, I basically relived the whole plot of that Doctor Who episode, Heaven Sent. Drake Hollow has a system almost completely ripped from games like Dark Souls, where you can spirit walk all the way back to your body, and this is where the real fun of the exploiting begins. You can only revive yourself as far as you've explored. That is, if I was halfway between two islands, I would be unable to drag my body forward to the island ahead of me and revive myself there, but I can still come back to life in the middle of the water, keep swimming forward until I die, and continually rinse and repeat the process until I've set foot 
on said new island. I'm honestly not sure why anyone else would even want to exploit the game in such a stupid way as I've done. But once again, keep in mind that when a game doesn't present me with a clear and obvious way to get something done, I will instead assume the straightforward approach is the best one, regardless of whether or not that is actually the case. Either way, it led to some unintentionally funny gameplay, so I can't say I regret doing so all that much. I think if there is one obvious problem with the game overall, is that the game is kind of unclear as to what it wants to be. Does it want to be a multiplayer experience or a solo one? The balance is totally fucked either way, with the crafting and combat being more geared towards solo play, and the resource management all but requiring multiplayer, with solo play being completely disregarded from a balancing perspective. Does it want to be a survival game? If so, why are nearly all the necessary food and other survival materials implemented as one-time uses, with almost no possibility for automated or manual regrowth or appearances? I'm all for making the survival challenging, but I'm not for making it impossible over the long term. Games like The Forest took a pretty reasonable stance as far as balancing the aspect of survival goes, making it fairly easy for experienced players to gather resources without any unnecessary limitations beyond the obvious ones. And yet, I don't hear many people having the balls to say that The Forest itself is an easy game because of those factors. So there's clearly a middle ground to be had between being challenging and being unreasonably and nonsensically restrictive. And that's something that Drake Hollow definitely fails at on its own. Likewise, does it want to be a wave-based PvE horde mode game? It has some of that here, but the enemies are so easy to defeat, even on your own, in a solo game, in a wave so incredibly small, that they end up not even being remotely close to being considered a danger, and instead are just like an unnecessary nuisance. There was one point where I was almost completely on the other side of the map. It would take about 10 minutes for me to get back from where I was to my base, and an enemy wave had spawned in and was attacking my base. I ran my ass all the way back to the base, wasting like 5 minutes of my time. And when I got there, they were still attacking the same wall of my base. They hadn't even destroyed anything of note in my base. I think they had broken like 2 fences and one other object. Compare that to any other survival game and 10 minutes would result in your base being completely destroyed. Utterly. If one of the uh, monsters like Armsy or Legsy from the forest decided to attack my base and I let it do so for the span of 5 minutes, I'd come back, everything would be gone. There, there would be nothing. Drake Hollow very much tries to be a jack of all traits and ultimately proves itself to be a master of none. If you're looking for just a few hours of fun that you can play through with a friend, it's passable enough. But I would hesitate to call it a good game and definitely wouldn't call it a great one. Given a reasonable price, which for the love of god this game is not priced as, in what universe is there? enough content for this game to justify a $30 price tag. I could get on board with a $15 price tag, maybe even a $20 one. $25 would really be pushing it, but $30? You're telling me that if I want to actually play the game optimally, the way it was meant to be played in multiplayer, I'd have to spend at least $60 for two copies, for only maybe two to four hours worth of content, before both of us give up, probably never launch this game again? Yeah, no, I don't think so. This is a decent enough game, but it's marked far too high for the limited amount of content you get and the almost non-existent replay value. The retail price just isn't all that justifiable. If you see this game like 40 or 50% off, by all means give it a try if you want, but at its retail price, I would recommend against buying it. Don't buy it. I'm all for paying 30, 40, 50, or even $60 for an indie game if the quality of the content and the length of that content warrants it, but this game meets neither qualification. So add it to your wish list if you want to, but whether or not you buy it, that's really up to you. I see a lot of pros and cons here. And I can entirely understand why some people would like it as a game and others really want it. But these are just my opinions, and on that note, that's where I'm going to wrap it up for today. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like. It helps this video get more noticed within the YouTube algorithms. If you want to see more videos like this one in the future, consider subscribing and clicking the bell to opt into getting notifications so you can be among the first to know when a new video goes live. YouTube will not always tell you when I upload without that, so clicking the bell to opt in really helps both you and me in the long run. My goal between now and Valentine's Day is to get to 1,200 subscribers. It'd be a bit of an uphill battle, but I'm confident we can do it. I'm hopeful at the least. Thank you to those of you that have already subscribed, clicked the bell and all that. Your continued support has made all the difference. It enables me to continue doing what I love. You wouldn't believe how much nasty initial criticism I got early on into my channel's lifespan telling me my channel would never go anywhere and I should, well, you get the idea. Your support along the way shows me that while I'm not perfect, I still have areas to improve on. At least I'm on the right path. So thank you as always. I honestly do appreciate that. I don't think I'm going to get tired of saying that. This is Warrior Dan signing out. Stay awesome, everybody. Stay safe and peace out.